Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more Conversations in the Digital Age. With us is an old friend, Jim Lindsay. Jim Lindsay is a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, and his specialty is the relationship between domestic politics and foreign policy. He is director of studies. Jim, we're delighted to welcome you back. This has been such an eventful week. That it has. And uh, certainly with the looming 2016 presidential elections, it becomes all the more important. Certainly does. Well, thank you for having me back, Jim. Glad to be here. Now, Jim, uh, we witnessed uh, the uh, performance at the U.N. General Assembly, Mm -hmm. the inconclusive and, I think, brusque meeting between Obama and Putin, Mm -hmm. and then the announcement to the United States on one hour's notice that uh, the Russians were going to start bombing in Syria. Now, what does all this bode for uh, American foreign policy in, uh, in the Middle East? Nothing good, Jim. It's an extra complicating factor in an already very complicated and difficult situation. And indeed, one of the things we've seen right away is what the Russians are saying is the reason for their activity doesn't match up with what they're doing. The Russians have argued that they need to enter and attack ISIS, but what they're actually doing is going after uh, elements opposed to the uh, government of uh, Bashar al-Assad in Syria. So they're helping to prop up Assad uh, along with uh, their uh, uh, coalition of Iraq and Iran. Exactly right. And here's the problem. Uh, You now have the potential uh, of unintentional conflict between U.S. forces uh, and Russian forces in Syria. Because as you noted, the Russians went in and started operating without notifying the United States. They haven't uh, provided where they're going to go. And it makes a very dicey situation. It also creates a... Uh, additional complication, Jim, which is it could lead uh, to actually strengthen the arm of ISIS. That is having uh, what we might call the moderate elements, or at least the non-ISIS elements, opposed to the government of Syria, deciding that the West can't help them, and hence driving them to ally with the Islamic State. Now, the Russians uh, appear to have scrupulously avoided bombing in the eastern part of the country, which are the ISIS enclaves. Uh, And Secretary Kerry said, well, we were ready to accelerate. The United States was ready to accelerate uh, bombing ISIS. Why haven't we done that a long time ago? Well, we have been bombing ISIS targets. The problem is is that air power, while important, uh, is not definitive. It can't uh, turn the tide. Uh, The hope was that the United States could, using, in essence, its allies or friends and proxies on the ground, be able to turn back the Islamic State. They've had some successes. Uh, but they haven't obviously been able to uh, overturn uh, Islamic State control in Syria and Iraq. I mean, it's a very difficult problem. I don't think anyone uh, should sort of escape that reality. Now, Obama's uh, U.N. speech, he repeated what he said many times before, which Mm -hmm. is Assad must go, that he's lost his uh, legitimacy. Mm -hmm. Uh, But former uh, ambassador to Iraq, Christopher Hill, differs with that. He says perhaps our intelligence was flawed, that Uh, Assad has hung in there for four years. Yes, he's had the support of others from the outside, but uh, he's there. Possession is nine points of the law. So why do we make uh, the elimination of Assad the cornerstone of U.S. policy in Syria? Uh, Well, I think that's one of the questions the United States really has to address. Does it make sense to continue uh, the policy of desiring uh, Assad's departure? I mean, I think to sort of go back, one of the issues that happened is that we wished his departure but didn't provide the means to make it happen. And so now he is there, and obviously the complicating factors with the strength of the Islamic State, if you succeeded in toppling the government of Mr. Assad, what would replace it? Would it be able to stand up to the Islamic State, or would you end up simply making a very bad problem a lot worse? And there are a lot of arguments that can go back and forth on that score. And again, Russia's entry... Uh, into this uh, issue by trying to prop up uh, the Syrian government as an additional complicating factor. Well, uh, it creates the possibility of uh, two possible outcomes in Syria, Mm -hmm. uh, none of them terribly palatable. One, that ISIS is in control of the country, uh, 
and the other is that Russia is in control of the country. Uh, they have a, a naval base, I think, in Tartus, right. and uh, it's been within their sphere of influence. They have troops on the ground. They're bombing uh, and the opposition to uh, Assad. And now neither of those outcomes is palatable to the United States, is it? Uh, neither one is desirable. I think that's important to keep in mind. I wouldn't quite say that the Russians end up controlling Syria. I think the more likely outcome, or the one we say have right now, is different parts of Syria are controlled by different groups. Obviously, the Islamic State controls uh, a good portion of the, I guess, the northeastern portion of uh, Syria, whereas uh, the government of Assad uh, uh, controls. I would say eastern Syria in the areas around Damascus. Uh, but it's a, it's a very unpleasant situation. And again, the Russian entry uh, greatly complicates it. I think the, the question for U.S. policy is, given sort of this uh, mix of undesirable outcomes, uh, which is the one that you can most live with? Uh, in essence, which is the, the, the lesser of, of, of the evils? And also the question of what sort of leverage do we have uh, to be able to change uh, what's there on the ground. And I think, you know, the events of the last 15 years, I think, have communicated to American foreign policy elites that what we want and what we can accomplish are two different things uh, and that our levers to sort of change the facts on the ground are quite limited. And one of the constraining factors for any American action, whether it's this president or the successor president, is to what extent are you willing to expend American military Power, not just air power, but combat troops on the ground uh, to try to change what's there. And I think one of the constraints is there's very little appetite in this country to send American troops in large numbers back on the ground. Been there, done that. Exactly right. Uh, so what do you see, given the fact that we have an empty holster, uh, what do you see as uh, the best outcome for the United States? I think probably the best outcome for the United States is to try to find some sort of negotiated solution. Uh, that puts us in a position in which, uh, rather than working against the Russians, uh, there's more common cause. Obviously, there's going to have to be more support uh, for uh, anti-Islamic state uh, forces on the ground. Uh, but it's very difficult to do that. Again, you know, we've had this policy of trying to train uh, Syrians to go against the Islamic state, and I think it's safe to say that that uh, strategy so far has been a failure. Uh, and the problem is, how do you make it succeed? Any kind of negotiated solution would, uh, of necessity, involve Russia, would it not? Exactly right. And how can we possibly negotiate with the Russians and take the position that Assad must go? Uh, that's where something has to give, one way or the other. And again, that's the nature of diplomacy. Uh, sometimes you have to choose uh, what your priorities are, and you may have to sacrifice some goals. And I think that's the real challenge for the White House. It was so uh, categorical uh, about Mr. Assad having to go and it's very hard to, for a president or administration to walk back from that. Uh, now, there's a, very, a variety of ways you could get around that. Perhaps you have a reshuffling at the top of the Syrian government. Maybe the Russians would be open to that. Uh, but again, we're in a position in which what we want and what we can do don't align now, very do you, well. Do you see the situation as it exists now as a fo major foreign policy defeat for uh, President Obama? I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a defeat, but it's certainly a problem. I mean, it, if you look out, you pick up the newspaper, you see this issue day in and day out, and we haven't seemed to be able to generate a policy that works. And it has big spillover effects. Uh, as we've seen in the last month or two, large numbers of refugees moving out of the Middle East, particularly from Syria, but not only from Syria, going into the European Union. This has caused major problems within the EU, which is already suffering from a variety of other ailments, many of them related to the inability to sort of overcome their debt crises and get the economy going. And it's really pulling big strains on the European Union. The United States has a vested interest in seeing the European Union succeed for a lot of reasons, not the least of the importance of the EU and the global economy. Uh, and this is creating a lot of challenges. But again, the problem is it's easy to identify the, identify the issues, to provide a diagnosis. The challenge is coming up with a prescription that can work. Well, let's uh, uh, morph ahead okay. uh, to uh, November of 2016, and uh, let's assume that the situation uh, hasn't uh, materially changed, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, we have an intractable uh, uh, situation on the ground, we have mm -hmm. a Russian presence, military presence, uh, uh, the opposition uh, to uh, Assad is mm -hmm. being uh, degraded by mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, Russian bombs, uh, as well as uh, uh, other Iranian activity and ISIS. Uh, and uh, we're uh, asked to take in ourselves uh, mm -hmm. 100,000 uh, Syrian refugees, mm -hmm. as well as the influx in Europe, which is causing a right-wing right. backlash. How do you see all this as, all this parade of horribles as uh, impacting the uh, 2016 election? Well, let's, let's look at it more broadly, and I would sort of say the following, and that is, well, I think foreign policy issues, whether we're talking about Syrian refugees or Russian behavior in Ukraine or Iran or what's happening in East Asia, I would say generally foreign policy will matter to voters much more than it will matter to the ultimate vote. And I mean that for the following reason. American elections presidential elections generally rise and fall on domestic issues. There's no reason to believe that that won't be the case in 2016. If you look at poll numbers right now, it clearly the American public is most concerned about domestic issues. But the of course, economy, immigration, jobs. immigration is a domestic issue. Well, and then you get into the question of whether immigration is domestic or foreign policy. We can come back to that. But obviously, there is a sizable uh, group of Americans, probably around a third right now, for whom issues of immigration, foreign policy, terrorism in particular, are sort of their top priority. Uh, but as it turns out, uh, it's really Republican voters who are most concerned about those issues. National security is higher up their list of must-dos than it is for Democrats. So the question is, from the vantage point of the impact on the vote, is our form, is foreign policy or our foreign policy issues likely to move people from supporting one party to the other? And right now it doesn't look that way. But obviously things can change. I mean, we are more than a year out from the election, and as we've seen over the last six months, let alone the last 12 months, a lot of things we weren't expecting can all of a sudden end up on uh, the political agenda. But of course, uh, foreign policy is an absolutely vital issue insofar mm -hmm. as our national uh, security is concerned. And let's look across the spectrum of this field of candidates. Yep. And uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, the qualities and elements that go into a person uh, that make them a successful candidate are not necessarily relevant to whether they're going to be good at statecraft or foreign policy. Oh, uh, you're exactly right. I mean, campaigning and governing are two different things, Jim. Campaigning is about visions and promises. Governing is about decisions or choices and decisions. And that's why in many cases when people succeed in getting to the White House, as the president, they discover they wish they hadn't said some things. Uh, when they are candidates. What should voters look for in the various candidates to see whether or not they'd be good at statecraft? That, that's a great question, and it's, I think, a very hard one to answer. I mean, obviously, I mean, when the American public looks at, looks at a president, they're judging a presidential candidate on lots of different dimensions. They're interested in, is this person someone they can see leading the country? Is it someone that they uh, think has the right temperament for doing so? I think that's important. Uh, Americans are probably interested in wanting to know what a, what a candidate knows about the world. I don't think the, vo the average voter is interested in, in establishing whether a candidate knows a lot about foreign policy. I think what average voters are looking for is, do they know enough? Uh, and can you envision the president, when he's sitting uh, behind the desk in the Oval Office, being able to handle that proverbial uh, 3 a.m. in the morning phone call and knowing what to do? Uh, and again, it's, it's very hard to know uh, beforehand who's going to do well at that job because I'm not sure that any uh, past set of experiences uh, train someone for just the raft of issues that end up uh, coming to the Oval Office. Uh, and also judgment is an important factor, isn't it? And uh, how do we assess the, the, uh, the judgment uh, a candidate is going to have, uh, should they be mm -hmm. successful in uh, uh, going into the Oval Office? I don't know if I could say that. But I think, you know, judgment along with temperament are really sort of the two greatest characteristics in successful presidents. But it's very hard beforehand to know uh, who's going to have it. I mean, if you go back in American history, if you were to look at sort of uh, candidates who look to be totally prepared to be president, uh, perhaps one of the best would have been a gentleman named Herbert Hoover who, coming into uh, the office in 1929, seemed to be the poster child for an incredibly accomplished uh, president. As we all know, his presidency didn't turn out terribly well. On the other hand, I think a lot of people, when Harry Truman became president uh, back in 1945, would have said he didn't have uh, what it took, and he was sort of almost an accidental choice as to be vice president. Uh, but he had a very successful uh, 
uh, presidency. So it can be very difficult beforehand to know who's going to do really well and who isn't. Moving forward to the modern era, I mm-hmm. mean, who have been the successful presidents in foreign policy? Well, if you would ask me to list my, my top presidents of the sort of post-1945 era, I would put George H.W. Bush at the top of my list. I think and He had a lot of relevant experience. He had a lot of relevant experience. He had great judgment. Uh, I think he surrounded himself with superb uh, set of advisors. When you think back uh, to who was uh, his advisors, uh, General Scowcroft, uh, Secretary of State Jim Baker, very, very accomplished people. And I think what's really interesting about uh, George H.W. Bush's presidency is that uh, he had a, a number of challenges uh, that he succeeded at the Gulf War, I think obviously won. But I think we tend to forget how successful he was in uh, managing the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and we tend to think of it as it was almost natural for it to turn out the way it did. I don't think it was. Uh, and it was an incredible amount of deft diplomacy uh, that I think uh, paid off really well that we have a Europe now that is uh, whole and peaceful. Obviously, we have an issue uh, in Ukraine. We talked about Russian behavior before. But I think if I were to sort of pick one president uh, from the last 50 years, it would be George H.W. Bush. Okay, using him as a model, let's, let's look at the Republican right. uh, candidates uh, mm-hmm. who uh, appeared in the debates. Let's start right. with uh, Carly Fiorina. Okay. No foreign policy experience that's discernible. Right. Uh, she wants to rebuild the Sixth Fleet and reinstitute the missile defense mm-hmm. program in Poland and aggressive military exercises in, in the Balts, right. Baltic states, more troops in Germany. Right. I mean, how do you uh, assess uh, her program? Well, I would step back a second and say, looking at most of the candidates uh, on both sides uh, of the ledger, uh, they have very little in the way of traditional foreign policy experience. And indeed, those candidates that do have foreign policy experience, certainly on the Republican side, uh, are actually doing fairly poorly uh, in the polling, at least at at this stage. That, of course, can change. I mean, I think when you look at uh, the program that you're talking about that... uh, uh, Ms. Fiorina has put forward. That was really sort of her steps in terms of how she would deal with uh, the possibility of Russian uh, aggression and pressure in Eastern Europe. I mean, some of those things obviously make sense. The, the United States, I think, uh, does need to spend more on its defense. Uh, hardly uh, can, can disagree with that. Uh, on other aspects, uh, Ms. Fiorina has said that she would not speak with uh, Mr. Putin. Uh, I think that I can understand the appeal of making that claim on the campaign trail, uh, but I think given the nature of the issues we face and the fact that Russia is a player, whether we like it or not, it's hard to see how you can sustain a we're not going to talk to Mr. Putin strategy. Okay. Senator Ted Cruz, he wants to rip up the Iran deal the day he's in office. Well, he's not the only one who wants to do that, uh, Jim. Obviously, when you look at the candidates, there's a division uh, between the two parties over whether the Iran deal is good or not. I think you'll see the Democratic candidates arguing that the Iran nuclear deal is in the best interest of the country. And indeed, uh, Democratic senators uh, came and rallied to the White House's uh, side on that issue. Uh, And I think within the Republican Party, there's a division not on whether the Iran nuclear deal is good or bad. I think there's uniformity that it's a bad deal. The question is, would you rip it up on day one? Some candidates like Senator Cruz have said, I would rip it up on day one. Others like Governor Christie, John Kasich of Ohio uh, have said that. Rand uh, Paul. Rand Paul. And I also think uh, Governor Jeb Bush from Florida have said, uh, let's hold off for a second. Not a strategy to rip up a deal. Well, in part because no one knows what the world will look like on January 20th, 2017. Uh, Events could be quite different. Uh, in what looks like uh, a wise step now would be imprudent then. So I think these are the sort of things that are typical of campaigns. There's going to be a lot of back and forth on that score among Republicans uh, about whether it's better to rip it up or to wait and see. Uh, Now, you said that uh, looking across the the whole spectrum, uh, no one has a great deal of relevant experience, but you would have to uh, concede that both Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton Mm -hmm. Uh, have considerable foreign policy experience? Well, let me step back. I I don't want to say that that most candidates don't. I would say on the Republican side, a big chunk of them don't have a lot of what we call the standard foreign policy experience. Uh, But putting that aside... Marco Rubio was on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for a number of years. John Kasich was on Armed Services services for 18 years. So So there are some that... Marginally relevant. So 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 there is experience, but again, many of the candidates on the Republican side uh, haven't. I think that... Uh, well, first, 
uh, Vice President Biden hasn't said he was going to join the race, and at least as we sit here right now, there's a lot of speculation as to whether he will or not. Obviously, Secretary Clinton has considerable foreign policy experience, uh, both as sort of as first lady, as senator from the state of New York, uh, and as secretary of state. And I think that's one of the uh, attributes that uh, she makes in the campaign trail. And if she becomes a nominee and uh, during the general campaign would argue that she has the experience to handle that 3 a.m. phone call and that she's ready and tested. Uh, what about uh, the pivot to Asia, which was certainly uh, something that Hillary Clinton was a part of and mm-hmm. Obama sponsored? And uh, the problem, of course, with the word pivot is it implies that you uh, are uh, embracing one interest and right. rejecting another. Uh, and Obama really uh, it could be uh, could be criticized for having too much of a hands off policy mm-hmm. on the, with respect to the Middle East. Uh, but has the pivot to Asia worked as a as a foreign policy? Uh, on balance, yes. And I think that the question that is certainly in the region is: uh, Are we going to see more of it? And is this administration really committed to it? And what will the attitude of the next administration be? Now, I think it's important when we talk about the pivot, or as I think now it's been rechristened, the rebalance, is that it was more than a purely military uh, strategy. And I think the administration made a mistake when it sort of introduced the pivot or rebalance to do it by talking about having 2,400 Marines uh, that would rotate through Darwin in Australia uh, because it sort of put the focus on the military aspect. I think you know, the, the big thing for the administration right now is, can it succeed on that economic component? Uh, I was in Southeast Asia this summer and talking to uh, various people. It's very clear they want the Americans in Asia, but they want American investment. They want American companies. Uh, they want to do trade with the United States. So for they them, being China? Or well, they being uh, the Malaysians, the Singaporeans, the ASEAN, no, the ASEAN no. countries, the Australians. And that's why TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, is so important. As we're sitting here talking right now, uh, U.S. negotiators and other TPP negotiators are down in Atlanta trying to see if they can get this agreement across the finish line. It's not clearly going to. There are a variety of of last-minute issues that are really keeping things from agreement. And I think for the administration, if it can get an agreement on TPP, uh, that will be uh, seen in the in the region as a major step. But then the question is, can you go from having an agreement in principle to one that the president can get through Congress? And that could become a very big issue uh, in the in the next 12 months of the campaign, particularly on the Democratic side of the table, where uh, certain parts of the uh, core constituency in the Democratic side is very skeptical of trade agreements. Because the Democrats traditionally have been a high-tariff party in order to protect American workers and, uh, and the like. Well, I think, you know, for, from the Democratic side, there's, there's a disillusionment about uh, what trade can do and that trade uh, hurts U.S. manufacturing, costs U.S. jobs. And again, if you get economists around the table, it's a much more complicated discussion. But I do think that, that certain core parts of the Democratic Party are deeply skeptical uh, about trade. The flip side is is that if you don't get success on TPP, if it falls apart, I think that will be seen in the region, in Southeast Asia, uh, as a major failure uh, on the part of the Obama administration. Uh, so do you think that is going to have some negative fallout for the Democrats if TPP doesn't pass? Or is, well, that, an, uh, is that an issue that really uh, doesn't affect voters? The voters seem to be uh, appealed to on the basis of uh, social issues, uh, Planned yeah. Parenthood. And, right. uh, well, I think if you don't get a deal, then it won't become an issue on the Democratic side. I think on the Republican side, Republicans argue, can argue that the president has not succeeded in uh, advancing our interests. But in essence, in purely political terms, in terms of how it affects the election, if you don't get a deal on TPP, then trade really won't be an issue uh, in the campaign. So I have a question for you, okay. Jim Lindsay. Okay. Uh, do you expect that uh, the uh, foreign policy failures of this Obama administration are going to influence the 2016 presidential election? I will come back to you, Jim, and say both the president's failures and his successes and which issues belong in which category are debated depending upon which party you're in. Uh, 
uh, are going to be issues that will be talked a lot about. There'll be a lot of uh, counter charges, but I don't think at the end of the day they're going to be pivotal in deciding who takes office January 20th, 2017. Won't be pivotal in deciding. So it's a leap into the future, a leap of faith into the future. Yeah, I think domestic politics will still, at the end of the day, be what drives the choices that most voters make. Uh, films about Planned Parenthood mm-hmm. and, uh, and abortion yeah, But also jobs, the future of America. Who, who do you want to entrust uh, with leadership of the United States over the next four years? Jim Lindsay, thank you for coming by. My pleasure, Jim. And thank you for coming by. Uh, Tune in next week for more conversations in the digital age. Please visit our website at www.digitalage.org. I'm Jim Zirin. All the best and take care.